Well, Shabbat Shalom. What a beautiful day. Who could tell me the name of the Torah portion today? Hmm, what's the Torah portion? I'll give you a hint. It's Chukat, which means a statute. Like, what's the difference between a, a statute, an ordinance, a law? There's all kinds of different words. Well, I'm going to teach you a little bit about what Chukat is. How many of you know, according to the Bible, death was very contaminating? I mean, for the person that died, it's all over. <laughs> but if you are next to someone who died, you become defiled, which doesn't mean sinful. De defiled doesn't mean sinful. Because as a matter of fact, you know, God wants us to bury the dead. So if you bury the dead, you're now unclean. Again, that's not sinful. What you do is you go get clean. And in this case, it's with the ashes of the red heifer. And you know, I was thinking about this. Well, I don't want to jump ahead. Okay. Look at Numbers 19, 1 and 2. And this pertained really before you entered the temple. I mean, you could be unclean for a long time, but if you want to go into the temple, then you had to be cleansed. So let's look at our Torah portion. In Numbers 19, 1 and 2, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and he said, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring a red heifer without spot, no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. So this had to be, I mean, red heifers are rare. They haven't been any for like 2,000 years, kind of give you an idea of how rare they are. And what is a chukot, the word statute? A chukot is a decree by God that cannot be understood by human reasoning. Now, how many of you know sometimes the kids come up to mom and dad and tell them to do something? Why? And mom and dad say, because I told you so. All right? Well, this is one of those kind of commands from God, but it's because we couldn't understand it. We have, I mean, this doesn't make sense. I, I did what you commanded. I buried somebody. That's a good thing. How come I can't go into the temple unless I have the ashes of the red heifer, you know, with living water sprinkled on me. It doesn't make sense. And so these are the commands that God requires us to do, and we just do them because we love them. We don't have to know the reason why. A lot of times we want to know the reason why before we do something. That's the human thing. But there are some things that God says, look, if you fear me, if you love me, you're just going to do it. So the ashes of the red heifer, what's fascinating about them, they have to be mixed with living water and then sprinkled on those who were contaminated. Well, let's look at something here. This is kind of like red dirt, and Abel was the first death, and in Genesis chapter 4, Four, verse 10, God tells Cain after the first murder in the Bible, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to be from the ground. Now, here in Hebrew is the word the ground. That first letter, hey, is the word the. And then Adama is ground. Now, here's what I want to point out to you. Where did man come from? The dirt, the ground. Well, here is the root of ground. Now, what is that first letter? What, yeah, what is, what is this letter? Aleph. And what is that? Dalet. And what is that? Mem. The mem makes the M sound. The Dalit makes the D sound. And so 
this is Adam or Adam. Adam came from the ground. So the very word ground has Adam in it. Wow, wow. Oh, but wait, there's more. Within the name of Adam is the word Dom, which means blood. And so right here, we see that Adam or, or that Cain killed Abel, Abel returns to the ground, and in that's the word ground, and Dom is blood, and his, actually, did you know that his blood is crying from the ground is a wrong translation? It's uh, actually bloods, plural, because not just his blood is crying from the ground, but all the generations that will never be born after him that were planned are also crying out from the ground. Now, this here, if you'll notice, the far right, what's that far right letter? Pay, which makes the P sound, the resh, which makes the R sound, and the hey, that is para. And then, you notice this is Adam, and the reason why is these vowel points. Just like in the dictionary, if you see the letter A, it might have a straight line for A, a curved line for A, a dot for A. Okay, well, they don't have vowels in Hebrew. What they have is these that tell you what the sound is. So if you notice, this A-D-M is the same as here, but it is Aduma. Instead of Adama, it's Aduma. I didn't do it. Okay, so right there, do you see the Aleph Dalet Mem in there? Okay, that is also red, like uh, Adam means red or ruddy. Para is heifer, and Aduma is the red heifer. So I think it's interesting. I believe that the reason for the red heifer to atone for death is because it is speaking of the first death where Abel died making atonement from the very first time the first murder occurred, the first death occurred. So I really believe the ashes of the red heifer is making atonement for the first murder where mankind's blood was crying out from the ground. And the word red, like Edom, Edom Esau is Edom. That's the same letters, and it means red. And so I just want you to know that Hebrew is very interesting how it all ties together. Now, in Numbers, let's look at 19, verse 3 and 4. How does it go? It says, you will give the red heifer to Eliezer, the priest, that he may bring her forth outside of the camp. Okay, so the red heifer sacrifice was not in the temple or by the temple. It was on the Mount of Olives. And, uh, of course, in this case, they're in the wilderness with Moses. But it says that the red heifer is to be slain before his face. And the Hebrew word there is pane, and it refers to face. Okay? Then Eliezer the priest shall take her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood <clears throat> directly before the tabernacle of the congregations seven times. Now, how many of you know that the guilty party is always supposed to face the judge? This is why the red heifer had to face the judge. So during the temple times, there was Jerusalem. This is the Mount of Olives. They built a bridge across so they wouldn't be contaminated going through the cemetery in the valley and coming back up. And I want you to notice the red heifer. The red heifer couldn't just be thrown on there any way. The head had to be to the south, and the heifer had to be facing the judge in the temple. Okay? It's the ultimate sacrifice, but it had to face the judge, just like a guilty party has to face the judge. Do you know there were only nine red heifers sacrificed from the time of Moses' tabernacle until 70 AD. Wow, you're talking 1,500 some years. Only nine were sacrificed. 
The Jewish sages, or the Jewish sage Maimonides, believed that the tenth red heifer. Now Maimonides was like a thousand A.D. Okay, that already killed nine. The temple was destroyed a thousand years later. Maimonides is writing. And he said that the tenth red heifer would only be found in sacrifice when King Messiah was ready to appear. That was a thousand years ago. Where we know the tenth red heifer right now is in Israel, and they're getting ready to sacrifice it. And so we know Messiah is ready to appear. But like I said, the red heifer was not a temple sacrifice. Therefore, no temple is needed. Okay, no temple is needed. And they had these red heifers they got last year and they had to wait because they weren't ready to be sacrificed. But right now, it's, they're all proven. They're ready to be sacrificed whenever Israel wants to do it. They can do it. But they have to do it on the Mount of Olives. It can't be done in the back 40. Well, because I was somewhat involved with this whole red heifer thing, I found out that they've already purchased the land on the Mount of Olives, so Israel owns it. So now it's just a matter of doing it at the appropriate time that they can get away with it because that is going to cause war. Now, if you look at Numbers 19, 6 through 8, it says the priest will take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet, cast it in the midst of the burning of the heifer, and then the priest washes his clothes, bathes his flesh, and then he can come back into the camp. And the priest is unclean. Isn't that weird? Here the priest is clean. He does the offering of the red heifer, and he becomes unclean by doing it. But it's supposed to clean everybody else. It says, whoever burns the heifer will also wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and he's also unclean until the even. So I think it's fascinating that the actions that cleanse the unclean makes the cleanser unclean. The cleansing and the overcoming of being in contact with death is to be done before God's face. Look at Leviticus 1.3. I want to emphasize this. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He'll offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And the word there before means before his face. If someone does something before you, that means you can see it. Now, this here wasn't a sin offering. It's just, it was an Ola offering. He's just doing an offering. And we know it wasn't a sin offering because it's of his own voluntary free will. But all the offerings had to be done for the Lord in front of the Lord. Look at Leviticus 3, 7. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it where? Before the Lord, in his face. Look at Leviticus 6, 25. Tell Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed, and it is before the Lord or before his face. Now, I want to point out something that's kind of fascinating. If we go to Matthew 27, it says, Behold, the veil of the temple rent. This is when Messiah died. In two, from the top to the bottom, and there was an earthquake, and the rocks rent. Now, when the centurion and those that were with him watching Yeshua saw the earthquake and those things that were done, in other words, the temple veil being rent, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now, here is the whole point that multitudes of Christians are clueless on. Messiah died on the Mount of Olives facing his Father. Every offering had to be done before the Father's face. That's why he was crucified on the Mount of Olives right above where the, where the red heifer was sacrificed because he's fulfilling the sacrifice of the red heifer, making atonement so we don't die. Does that make sense? And then it also says, uh, let's see, that there was a garden nearby and he was buried nearby where he was crucified. This is why 
there are four, three or four sites of where they think Jesus was buried. And they're all behind the temple. No, it's impossible. He is buried on the Mount of Olives. That's where he was buried. Now, listen to this. I have, since the red heifer was burnt to ashes, at this very site on the Mount of Olives, this spot was then the point of origin for the main purification rites, and therefore Yeshua the Messiah, the supreme sacrifice, who was representing the red heifer, had to die facing the Holy of Holies. Now, Numbers 19. Oh, and think about this. How would the soldier see the veil of the temple rent if he was behind the temple? Okay, I mean, the whole thing is just dumb. Okay, Numbers 19, 9 through 12. It says, a man that is clean gathers up the ashes and lays them up without the camp. If you remember in the book of Hebrews, it talks about him who died without the camp. That is totally referring to the ashes of the red heifer. It's to be kept for the congregation for a water separation. It's a purification for sin. But whoever gathers the ashes is also unclean. And uh, this will be done to the children of Israel and to the stranger that's sojourning among them for a statue forever. Whoever touches the dead body of anyone is unclean for how many days? Seven days, which is 7,000 years, the time of man, okay? And then it says they have to purify themselves with it on the third day and on the seventh day. He's to be clean. Whoever doesn't purify himself on the third day, the seventh day, he will not be clean. So in other words, they're thinking, oh, I'll, why should I go get clean on the third day? On the seventh day, I'll be clean anyway. Why do the extra thing? But Messiah, uh, God is saying, no, that's not the way it is. Now, here's what I was also mentioning. Talk about a holy war, red cows, Gaza, and the end of the world. This just came out a couple months ago, April 5th, from Newsweek magazine. The, one of the big problems, why they attacked on October 7th, was because of the red heifers, because the Muslims know that is huge. That is the sign of the end times, and they do not want Israel to be clean. But guess what a prophecy, there's a prophecy that points to today that's in the book of Ezekiel. Look at this. Chapter 36, verse 24 through 28. I will take you from among the heathen. Okay, that is God bringing the Jews back to the land. I'm going to gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. And then what am I going to do? The only way you can sprinkle clean water is if there's a red heifer. <laughs> okay, this is huge. This is why they're going to be doing the red heifer ceremony very soon to fulfill this prophecy that God is going to spring uh, sprinkle clean water on them and they'll be clean from all their filthiness, from all their idols while I cleanse you. And he says, a new heart I'll give you, a new spirit. Doesn't that sound like the new covenant? Okay, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you, cause you to walk in my statutes. That's chukat, that's the day's Torah portion. You'll keep my judgments, you'll do them and you'll dwell in the land I gave to your fathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. This is one of the biggest prophecies that is about to come to pass when they offer the ashes of the red heifer. No, Messiah is at the door. Now, here's the thing about the water. Look at Numbers 19, 17, and 18. An unclean person, they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer a purification for sin, and what kind of water? It can't be out of a horse tank. Just like the immersions aren't to be done in a horse tank. It's to be living water, running water. And that is put into a vessel. So it's running water put into a vessel. And then a clean person takes the hyssop, dips it in water, sprinkles it on the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the people that were there and upon him that touched a bone or one slain or one dead or a grave. Now imagine back then... You're living in tents. I, I like camping, but I don't know about camping for 40 years, you know. And let's say you have a family in a tent and dad dies. Everybody in the tent's unclean. And you got to bury dad. 
And so you go bury dad, and the next seven days, everyone's unclean, and then they have to have the ashes of the red heifer put on them. Well, think about this. Look at Numbers in our Torah portion, chapter 20, verse 1 through 5. After we hear all about this, then came the children of Israel, even the entire congregation, into the desert of Zen in the first month. What happens in the first month? Passover, right? Everyone's to keep the Passover. You have to understand Numbers 20 is at the end of the 40 years of wandering. 40 years have gone by. And what happens? The people abode in Kadesh and Miriam died there and was buried there. Oh my word, the whole congregation's unclean. Moses is unclean. Aaron is unclean. It's the first month and it's probably right around Passover. And now they're all unclean for seven days. And there was what? No water. <laughs> no water. Now what are we going to do? There's no water. Here we got, we're unpurified seven days, and there's not even any water for the ashes of the red heifer to sprinkle all of us with. And can you imagine how Moses and Aaron feel about their sister just died? They're, I mean, they're, that means a lot to them. And there's no water. And so they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people chode with Moses and spoke, saying, Would to God that we had died? Now, how would you feel? Your sister just died, and then all these people go, Well, we wish we would have died too. I mean, just slap them. When our brethren died before the Lord 40 years ago, they're saying. <laughs> and then it says, why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into the stinking wilderness that we and our cattle should die? Why have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It's no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates. Neither is any water, Moses. <laughs> wow. Well, Miriam dies and there's what? No water. Well, guess what? The Hebrew word for water is mayim. And the Hebrew word for Miriam is mayim with a resh in it. Okay, so I don't know if you can hear the water, but I want you to notice this. I've got the water running there. Mayim is water. Yam in yellow means the sea, like the Red Sea. Even the word sea is in the word for water. Here, if you take the race out, you get Mayim. So what happens? Miriam dies and there's no water. Fascinating. And so what do we see uh, here? But also think about this. Miriam represented water. All right, Miriam inter was introduced by water at Moses' birth, and the living waters represent, during the ashes of the red heifer, the living waters represent the word of God and his life-giving powers, like Jeremiah 17, 13. If you look at your notes, it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you will be ashamed. They that depart from me shall be what? written in the earth because they forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. The Lord is the living water in the mikveh that cleanses from death. You know mikveh, mikveh, and mikvah. They're basically the same thing. The word for hope is a mikvah, and mikvah is the living water. So hope and living water go together but you know what's interesting? How, Jeremiah 17, 13, it says, they that depart from me will be written in the earth because they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Do you remember when the woman caught in adultery was about to be stoned and all these guys around her wanted to bring up Moses and say, kill her? Do you remember that? And then... In John chapter 7, 
they forsook the fountain of living waters. In John 7 is when Yeshua stood up and said, if any man thirsts, let him come after me, as the scripture says, and out of him will flow rivers of living water. That happened that day. And the next day, that was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. The next day is Simchat Torah, rejoicing in the Torah. And they're trying to use the Torah to kill the adulterous woman. And then what does Yeshua do? He starts writing in the earth. Did you ever what he was, wonder what he was writing? I can tell you. It's right here in Jeremiah 17, 13. All who forsake you will be ashamed, and they that depart from me will be written in the earth. He was writing their names in the earth because they just forsook the fountain of living waters. There's your connection right there. If you look at Ephesians 5.26 concerning the congregation of the Messiah, he wants to sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water, which is in the word. Now, you remember last week we were talking about in number 1710, where the Lord tells Moses, because they were trying to decide with the whole situation with Korah, which who's in charge. And so he said, bring all the sticks together, or rods together, and only Aaron's rod blossomed and bloomed, right? And then in number 1710, God said to Moses, okay, I want you to bring Aaron's rod before the ark to be kept for a token against who? The rebels. Okay, so now what do we see in Numbers 26 through 10? Moses and Aaron are mad because here their sister died and these rebels are rebelling. And to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appears to them. And look, the Lord told Moses, go get the rod, the one against the rebels. Gather the, everyone together, you, Aaron, your brother, and speak unto the rock before their eyes. I mean, would you look kind of dumb if you're talking to a rock? He's supposed to speak to the rock. But here's the rock. Aaron's rod, the rod that Moses takes isn't Moses' rod. It's Aaron's rod that's taken as a, kept as a token against rebels. And so he has that rod. He has to hand it in one hand as a token to the rebels while he speaks to the rock. But what does he do? He takes the rod and hits the rock. Now he's, Moses is in big trouble. Water does come out. Okay, so God does honor it, and they get their water from the rock. And it says, it'll give forth water and bring forth them water out of the rock. So shall you give the congregation and their beasts to drink. And then it says, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. And then Moses and Aaron gathers the congregation together before. Notice it says the rock, not a rock. The rock. Why does it say the rock? 40 years earlier, when he struck the rock and the water came out, that same rock followed them for 40 years. Did you ever think about that? The rock that the water came out of followed them for 40 years. That's why it was strike the rock. Now, if you may question me, let me show you about some rocks that move by themselves in the desert. It does happen. And you can go to a website that talks about the mystery of the sailing stone solved. They understand how rocks move on their own. This is just scientifically. You could go type in sailing, mystery of sailing stones. You're going to see this is a natural phenomena that can happen under certain conditions. Well, look at this. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. And so Moses goes, here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? The big problem is Moses thought he's the one that's going to get the water, not God. God said, speak to the rock. Well, guess what? How many of you know there's lots of rocks in Israel? If you go to Israel, <laughs> there's rocks everywhere. They felt the water would come out from their own power. In Numbers 20, 11, Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice and the water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their beasts also. Listen now, 
with new ears to 1 Corinthians 10, 4. They all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. There it is. The rock followed them. You ever seen that before? And the rock was Messiah. Now, in Numbers 20, 23 and 24, the Lord tells Moses and Aaron at the top of Mount Or by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, okay, Aaron, it's time to go. Uh, you're not going to enter into the land that I gave to the children of Israel because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Okay, who can tell me? Well, let me go to the next verse. Numbers 20, 27 through 29. So Moses did as the Lord commanded. They went up to the Mount Or in the sight of all the congregation. And then it says, Moses didn't have Aaron take off his garments. Moses didn't just take off his garments. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments. And they put them upon Eleazar, his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. What day did Aaron die? Come on, who can tell me? Come on. What? What? First of all, which is coming up very shortly, he is the only person in the entire Bible where we have the exact date of his death. And it was on the first of Av. They mourned for 30 days, which means they mourned all the way through Av to the month of Elul, which is the month of repentance. And in Numbers 21, 8 and 9, the Lord says to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it will come to pass, everyone that is bitten when he sees it shall live. Wow, everyone was being bitten by these serpents and they were dying. And so God tells Moses, make a fiery serpent. Everyone who looks at it will. This is why in the medical business, you have a serpent around a pole to this day to bring healing. That's what that's from. And it says, Moses made the serpent of brass, set it upon a pole. It came to pass, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked to the serpent of brass, he lived. Well, brass speaks of judgment. Okay, and the word for pole is ness, which means a miracle, which is kind of fascinating. Not just pole, but a miracle. This is why we see in John 3, 13 and 14, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, I think that is just incredible. With that said, let's stand. <clears throat> Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much. I just pray right now you would give all of us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to understand what you're trying to teach us with your eternal word, a word that lives forever. Father, so that we would not be as the murmurers and as the complainers, and that we would realize that you truly fulfilled the ashes of the red heifer to cleanse us from the very, very beginning, the first murder of Abel's sin <clears throat> by fulfilling the ashes of the red heifer. We thank you for it. And Father, we thank you for all those who <clears throat> give their tithes or offerings to you these are to you to expand your Torah, to magnify it, to make it honorable once again. We want to be a light to the nation. So we thank you for all those who participate in doing just that. In Yeshua's name, amen. Take a break. Oh, well, let's do that. I forgot. Blessed are you, Lord our God, our creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Okay, I'm going to start a new series. Now, many of you are somewhat familiar, but I looked at it was several years since I've taught this, and I've taught maybe little sections of it spotty throughout. But I'm finally going to finish writing my book on the Song of Songs and Solomon. And so I'm going to, it helps me when I'm writing the book if I'm teaching on it as well. And so what we're going to present right now is dun, 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 Solomon, the epitome of a human king and the biggest failure. 
That's what he was. Now, let's take a minute and look at the historical background. And the reason why I'm doing this now is because I believe the Antichrist is going to be just like Solomon. Solomon is a type of Antichrist. And I know that may come as a shock to many, but by the time we're done, you're going to see it so clearly. And to understand the Song of Songs, you have to understand who Solomon was. So we, it's always good to start at the beginning. Let's look at what Moses, God told Moses, 400 years before Solomon. In Deuteronomy 17, 14, it says, When you've come into the land which the Lord your God will do what? Man, how many of you would like an acre of land given to you? How about 10,000 acres, a whole nation? Wow, given. It says, and you say, I want a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. How many know God knew in advance what would happen 400 years later? This is how you know there has to be a God, because only he can say things and make sure it happens 2,000 years later. So God knew now that God did not want them to have a king, but he says, I know you humans. I made you. And I know 400 years from now, you're going to want a king. So look at verse 18. It says, when that king is sitting on the throne of his kingdom, he has to write himself a copy of this Torah in a book. There were no printing presses. Everything had to be done by hand. It would take over a year for a scribe to write the whole Torah. But things that people don't catch. It says, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest. So the priests have the actual Torah scroll. And then the king has to write himself a copy of it. And the priest would watch over to make sure he didn't miss a jot or a tittle. Okay, but if you were the king, you would say, okay, Joe, you go write it for me. But God says, no, no, you can't hire someone or order someone as the king to have them write it. You have to write every single letter, every single word. Why would that be? And if they know it, they're accountable. I don't know that. No, they're accountable. Now, it goes on to say that he also has to carry it with him everywhere he goes. How many of us know that every house in America probably has six Bibles in it and they never open it? It's just sitting on the table or on the shelf. They got their big family Bible and it's never been opened. It looks all brand new sitting there 40 years later. Well, this says he has to not only carry it, he has to read, read it. Every day of his life, he has to be reading. Well, if Chris was like to say, well, we're kings and priests, well, guess what? You better carry your Bible with you and read it every day. And then it says, the purpose is that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this Torah and these statutes, to do them. How many of you know, I'm surely no politicians here think they're greater than the rest of us peons, do they? Do you know any politicians that, hello, well, the king would obviously think he's above the law like so many politicians do today. Well, he has to realize he has a boss that he's got to report to. And look at this. This is what I have in bold in your notes. The whole purpose is so his heart is not lifted up above everybody else. He's no better than everybody else. He's been given power and authority, but it's to rule well. And it's so that he doesn't turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, to the end that he may do what? Have a long life. Okay, he and his children in the midst of Israel. But now look at Ezekiel chapter 28, one through five. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyrus. Now tell me who you think this prince of Tyrus symbolically represents. 
Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up. And you said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God. Though you set your heart as the heart of God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. Wow, there's no secret they can hide from you. But look what happened. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you've gotten yourself riches. You've gotten gold and silver into your treasures. And by your great wisdom and by your traffic, have you increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. So here we have someone who's very extremely wise. They've got lots of riches due to their wisdom, and it causes their heart to be lifted up. We can see that's not a good thing, right? All right, as we see this unfold, when did God become Israel's king? When did God become Israel's king? When Israel became a nation in the Exodus. Okay, Exodus 19 at Shavuot or Pentecost, God enters a covenant with them. Do you know in Genesis, he's not called the king. He's called the great shepherd. He was always a shepherd. God is always a shepherd, and then he is a king. Solomon was never a shepherd. But with that said, God was upset because they didn't want him as a king anymore. And when did they reject him as king? What time of year? on the anniversary of their wedding at Shavuot. Here God became their king at Pentecost, and it was on Pentecost they rejected him as their king. They wanted a king like all the nations. So God was not happy. Let's look at 1 Samuel 8, 7 through 21. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. He said, Samuel, they've not rejected you. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works they've done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even until this day, works with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, they're also doing to you. And so then God says, Samuel, listen to their voice. But if if someone rejected you, the first reaction is, fine, get out of here. But God says, oh, Samuel, warn them. Tell them how horrible it will be if they have a human king. And so that's what he does. Look at this. He says, surely protest solemnly to them and show them the kind of king who is going to reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked for a king. And he said, this is what the king is going to do. He's going to take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint commanders over thousands and fifties. Some do plow his ground and reap his harvest and make his weapons of war and weapons for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take your fields, your vineyards, your olive yards, even the best, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his eunuchs and to his servants. In other words... He's going to tax you. It's a government. And these humans are going to take everything from you, and it becomes theirs. He'll take your male slaves, your slave girls, and your finest young men, and your asses, and put them to work. He'll take the tenth of your sheep. You'll be his servants. And then he says, you're going to cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourself, and the Lord's not going to answer you in that day. But guess what? It says the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, we will have a king over us, and we shall be also we, like all the nations, so that our king may judge us to go out before us and fight our battles. So Samuel heard all the words of the people and repeated them in the ears of the Lord. 
Okay, so it's all his servants and, you know, everything becomes the kings. Now, who was the first king in Israel? Saul. Okay, Saul was king. Uh, then, a little bit later, David is also king. Do we hear about Saul or David doing any of those things that we just read? No, it's not there. So let's look at Hosea 3, very important verse, or 13. Hosea 13, 9 through 11. He says, O Israel, you have destroyed yourself, but in me is your help. I will be your king. I will be your king. Where is any other that can save you in all of your cities and your judges of whom you said, Give me a king and princes? And look what God says. I gave you a king in my anger. And I took him away in my wrath. Why? Because God wanted to be their king. So what happens, Israel says, we don't want God. We want a human king. Now, <clears throat> I want to start here too. In 2 Samuel 12, 24 and 25, David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and laid with her. She bore a son and called his name, what? Solomon. And what does it say? The Lord loved him. This is what is so sad. The Lord truly loved Solomon, and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Yedida, which means a friend of God or the beloved of God. So Solomon was known as the beloved of the Lord. Now look at 1 Chronicles 29.1. David's about to die. And he says, uh, furthermore, David the king said to everybody, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen is what? Young, tender, and the work to build the temple is great. For the palace isn't for man, but for the Lord God. As a matter of fact, at 1 Kings 3, 7, look what Solomon says. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I don't know how to go out or how to go in. So we see Solomon started out good. Beloved of the Lord. And then look what God does for Solomon. We're going to look at 1 Kings 3, 13 and 14. God is saying to Solomon, and I have also given you that which you have not asked. Look what God gave him. Riches, honor, so that there will not be any among the kings of the whole earth like to you all your days. If you walk in my ways, keep my statutes, my chukat, my commandments, as your father David did walk, then I will also Lengthen your days. Well, what else did he get? It says God gave him that. Look at 1 Kings 4, 29 through 31. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceedingly much. He even gave him largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Here it is. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country, all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone on earth, wiser than Ethan and Heman and Koko, Ladarda, the sons of Maho. And then it says his fame was in all nations. Wow. He also became the white. God gave him phenomenal wisdom and he made him world famous. But God's the one who gave it. Look at 1 Kings 4, 34. There came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. Okay, we know from, this is in your notes, you can add it. But in Luke 12, 48, it says, unto whom so ever much is what? Given of him shall be much required. What did God, uh, Solomon did not earn any of these. God just gave it to him. He gave him wealth, great wealth. He gave him honor. God gave him a long life. He gave him wisdom. He gave him fame. He gave him power. 
Now, many of us, man, just give me one of those. You know, I'd be happy if I just had money, or I'd be happy if I was just famous, right? But Solomon, what more could be added? What, what more could God give him? He also had over a thousand concubines and a bunch of wives. And here's Solomon. He's the, acts like a baby. Total likely like a baby. Now, let's watch this. Remember what we just read. Let me, let me go back here a minute. Uh, okay, yeah, right here. He's going to take your sons and appoint them for himself and his chariots and his horsemen and his harvest and his weapons and his and his and his. <gasps> well, look at this. 1 Kings 9, 22. But Solomon did not make any slave out of the sons of Israel, but the sons of Israel were men of war and his servants and his rulers and his commanders, rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. These were the chief of the officers who were over God's work. Solomon's work. He wasn't doing this for God. He was using everything that God had given him to advance himself. What, what do you think the people thought of Solomon's rule? Does anybody know what? I mean, when you, you want to know if it's a good king or a bad king, you ask the generation who lived under the king. Do you think the people under Solomon thought he was fantastic? Let's look at what the Bible says. Uh, if you remember, Solomon dies. His son, Rehoboam, is now has a competitor called Jeroboam. All right. And let's look what this says. 1 Kings 12, 9 through 11, he said to them, Rehoboam, what advice do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to us, saying, please lighten the yoke which your father put on us? So here, the people say Solomon was the big burden. There's this big yoke Solomon has put on us. So that tells you one thing. And it says the young men who had grown up with Rehoboam spoke to him and said, hey, speak to this people who spoke to you saying, your father made our yoke heavy. So we already know all the citizens thought Solomon put a heavy yoke on them, but you make it lighter for us. This is what you should say to them. My little finger will be thicker than my father's loins. And now my father loaded you with the heavy yoke. I'm going to add to your yoke. Solomon whipped you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Okay, so wow. They're saying Solomon was absolutely horrible, and his Solomon's own son admitted that Solomon had whipped him with whips. And that they loaded the people with a heavy yoke. Now, why is it called Solomon's temple? He built it. <laughs> he didn't really. How many of you have ever been at a business where you did all the work and the boss got all the credit and never gave you any credit for all your work? You know what I'm talking about? Solomon didn't lift his finger a bit. Let's begin with the pattern. To build everything? Look at what this says. First Chronicles 28, 11 through 19. David gave to Solomon the pattern of the porch, of the houses, the treasuries, the upper rooms, the innermost rooms, the place of the mercy seat, the pattern of all that David had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and all the rooms around the treasuries. Okay, David is the one who got the pattern and he gave it to Solomon. And then look at the last uh, line there, that section underlined, it says, everything was in writing from the hand of the Lord David says, he made me understand all the work of the pattern. So David is the one who got the pattern from the Lord. David is the one who also gave Solomon the pattern. Now look at 1 Chronicles 29. Look what David says to the congregation. Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and tender. The work is great. 
And then it says, the palace is not for man, but for the Lord. And look what David says. I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. I prepared the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the wood, the onyx stones in abundance. So David provided all these things in abundance. And then he says, because I've delighted in the house of my God, out of my own treasure of gold and silver, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And he mentions all of these things. And then the next underline, the chiefs of the fathers and the rulers of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands and hundreds with rulers of the king's work, they offered how? Okay, this is a volunteer thing, just like with Moses' tabernacle when they had to say, stop, stop giving. Everybody is giving into this. And look at this. Look what people gave for the house of God. 5,000 talents of gold, 10,000 derricks, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 100,000 talents of iron. And he who had precious stones gave to the treasury of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Okay, people are flooding with all of this, everything that's needed. And look what David, look at the difference between David and Solomon. Listen to what David says in verse 16. Oh Lord, our God, all of this store that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name, it all comes from your hand. It's all your own. None of this is us giving what we have Everything we have belongs to you anyway. You see the attitude. Look at verse 19. He says, give to Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, and to do all these things and to build the magnificent house for which I have made ready. David's got everything ready. Okay. Now, typically, everyone is motivated. Everybody says, let's do it. Let's do it. And then what happens if things get put off? and put off, and put off. What happens to the people's motivation? Well, look at 1 Kings 6.1. And it happened in the 480th year after the sons of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. He waited four years to build the house of the Lord. Everything was made ready. Everyone's excited. Let's go. And Solomon waited four years to even begin it. As a matter of fact, in 1 Kings 6, 37 and 38, in the fourth year, in the month of Ziph, the foundation, he waited four years to just even lay the foundation. And then in the 11th year, in the month of Bull or Heshvan, which is the eighth month, the house was finished as to all its parts. And as to all its plants, so he was seven years in building it. He waited four years, even though everyone was voluntarily giving everything, they were all excited to build the temple of the house. Solomon, first thing he does is say, ah, oh, let's just wait. And they had to wait four years before they could even get started. Why do you think it took him so long to get started? Well, let's look at what the Bible says. In 1 Kings 7, 1, Solomon was 13 years building his own house. Uh, oh my goodness, that's got to take some time. And then look at 7, 8. Solomon also had a build a house for Pharaoh's daughter who he wasn't supposed to marry. God says, don't marry. Don't go back to Egypt for no reason. But he had to build a house for her. That had to take some time. Now, listen to Psalms 127.1. This is David who was written a letter to his son Solomon. Look at this. It's for Solomon. And he says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Okay. He's saying, Solomon, unless the Lord builds his own house, you will labor in vain. You following me? Okay. Well, let's look. Okay. I have it here. This is the dedication of the temple. Solomon is, they finally got it done. They're celebrating, and Solomon wants to go and pray before God. And how do you know if someone's really a narcissist or really into themselves? What do they talk about? I, me, my. Okay, and not only that, they don't want to give any credit to anybody else. 
I'll show you verses next week where Solomon had like 600,000 workers from Lebanon and 700,000 workers from Israel. And they're all working to build the house, right? It's not a one-man affair. Well, let's look at his prayer. 1 Kings 8, 13. I have surely built you a house to dwell in. Look at verse 20. The Lord has performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Look at verse 44. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, wherever soever they shall send them, and shall pray to the Lord toward the city which you have chosen and toward the house which I have built for your name. Verse 48. And so return unto you with all their heart, with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive. Pray unto you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers and the city which you have chosen. And of course, the house which I have built for your name. Now, okay, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Who built it? Who took the credit for building it? Solomon. Look at Ecclesiastes 2.11 that Solomon wrote at the end of his life. I look on all the works that my hands have done and on the labor that I had labored to do and all is vanity and vexation of spirit and there's no profit under the sun. Why is all vanity? Because he took all the credit. And what did David say? Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. And here he's realizing he's laboring in vain. But it gets worse. I want to go back to this. Oh, I went the wrong way. Let me go here. Okay. God gave him all of that. All of that. And look what he says in Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 19. Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous to me. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor. He hated building the temple because I have to leave it to the men that's after me. All of my wealth and all of my goods and all of my houses. I hate life because I've got to leave it to somebody else. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. Yet he's going to have rule over all my labor wherein I labored and wherein I have showed myself to be so wise. This is also vanity. Talk about the ultimate narcissist. He had everything given to him, and he's a whiny, whiny, because he might have to give it to somebody else. That's not fair. Does this give you a new light a little bit on Solomon? Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till next week. But I'm going to go through and tie the New Testament that talks about Solomon as well as the Old Testament. And we're going to link them all together. And you're going to find out what a big whiny baby Solomon actually was. And then we're going to teach the Song of Songs so you better understand. And I can tell you right now, no one has ever taught the Song of Songs like I do. And it's not like what you think. It has nothing to do with what you think. I will give you a, a little hint. Did God want Israel to have a king? No. Who was supposedly the best human king that could be given to them was Solomon. And in the Song of Songs, the bride is in the king's chamber. She knows who the king is. She knows what the king does. But what does she do? It, it's like the kid's cartoon where the lady is in the castle and she's looking out the tower and she's trying to escape because she's been trapped. And she sees a shepherd and she says, uh, tell me who I love so much, where you feed your flock and where do you make it rest at noon? Well, now, wait a minute. Solomon was never a shepherd. She knows the king but she's following a shepherd, and God was their shepherd before anything else. So the Song of Songs is about God wooing Israel and humanity away from a human king back to him as their shepherd king who loves them and cares for them. 
And think about it. What does she say? Oh, I love you. But where do you work? Uh, oh, oh, and by the way, when do you make your flock rest at noon? Because I don't want to work with you. I just want to come at lunch and I want to visit and have you just love me, love me, love me, love me. She's not concerned about him. She doesn't know anything about him. But oh my goodness, she professes love. And so what you're going to see all through the Song of Songs, what this is about and how it's very prophetic. The book of Song of Songs is prophetic about today. It's about the maturation or the maturity of the bride, where the bride is totally self-centered. She doesn't want to work the harvest. And then after a while, she ends up wanting to work the harvest. She gets up early and she works with the shepherd. So that is really what the Song of Songs is about. Continually through it, she goes to sleep. And how many of us know the church is always going to sleep? Uh, and there are some horrible mistranslations in that book that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through all that. So get ready. Hold on. Buckle up. We're going to have the funnest time over the next couple of months as I go through Solomon and the, and the songs, and you'll see how prophetic it is for today. Amen. Let's stand. Amen. <clears throat>